what are the top content marketing lessons we've learned in 2020 that are going to get us through 2021. Now, we've been dealing with content marketing for over a decade now, and the industry is evolving so quickly that sometimes SEO is king, sometimes it's um, you know social media or PPC or something else. Things are evolving real fast, um, and different channels work Sometimes, again, social media is leading the charts and um, essentially things are moving really quickly. But in a nutshell, producing content is still the most important thing uh, that matters to three of my companies. And this is the reason why we're spending so long on working with customers, on working on ourselves, on improving different content strategies as we speak. So as a result, here are the most important tips that we have identified for the year of 2021. And hopefully these are going to be helpful to you as well. Number one, persistence is key. Shocker, I'm pretty sure you're not surprised whatsoever, but really persistence is the most important thing in content marketing. Uh, we've had several instances of just abandoning the blog for a few months or just uh, you know stopping our efforts onto something. And it's really hard to get out of the rabbit hole after, which is why making sure that your business is planning for your content marketing efforts in the long run is extremely important if you want to stay ahead of the game. Um, again, this is super important and I'm also going to, to record another video and, and prepare another post on uh, staying ahead within your own industry, within your own ecosystem. And again, one of the leading things is to be consistent, to always be around, uh, or as my friend John Hall says, to be top of mind, which is the name of his uh, uh, book. So in a nutshell, persistence is key. Try to stick to a schedule that you can repeat. Don't overextend yourself. Uh, don't do something that um, you, know, you can't follow through in a continuous period of time. Even if it's once a week, or even if it's once every two weeks, it's still fine. Just make sure that whatever you pick as a plan for producing content, for posting content, for sharing content, you can follow through you know, 95% of the time. Number two, content upgrades are critical. Uh, one of the things that happens with content, especially when it comes to SEO, especially when it comes to just relevance, is um, decaying content. It's content that is no longer as relevant or it appears as it hasn't been updated or it appears that potentially because it's old and it has been posted a while ago, uh, it's no longer as helpful and as relevant. Google knows that, other networks know that as well and other search engines, which is why, again, one of the key things you can do to improve that is preparing and, and generating content that is open to upgrades. Now, um, over the past couple of years, I've been producing a lot more content related to listicles. And even if I'm not the biggest fan of listicles, I'm more into, you know, brainstorming and essays and, and you know, considerations and so forth. Listicles are easier to follow through and it's easier to work with listicles. It's easier to, you know, just pinpoint specific pieces of advice that you would be using. So I do understand the benefits and the perks of working with listicles in the first place. But more importantly, listicles are normally something you can expand easy. Uh, what do I have in mind here? Uh, well, whenever, uh, whenever you build a piece of content with listicles, it's normally, I don't know, 25 twos that you this or 70 pieces of yada yada or top 20 books or 13 ways to do something else, right? Listicles are easier to expand. I have multiple list, uh, listicles that I keep upgrading every now and then. Usually it's not too often, it's like twice a year, but it's still important. It still tells Google that I care about this piece of content, uh, that it's something that I'm going to work on and, and, and evolve and I'm going to refresh it and make it uh, even more so helpful to my target audience. So again, content upgrades, super important. I've spoken to lots of people. I've read a lot of um, content. I've listened to a lot of podcasts by top content writers. Uh, they all do agree with this. Content upgrades are extremely important. That's something you need to care about. If you also use tools like ClickFlow by Eric Sue, you can also keep track of content that's decaying over time, meaning that you no longer receive more traffic. It's actually uh, falling down and rankings are falling down. So tools like ClickFlow can actually also help you to uh, capture this decaying content and upgrade it so that you don't lose motion, you don't lose attraction. Number three is content pillars make a difference. 
Now, when you're starting a blog normally, uh, or another type of piece of content, when you're starting a blog, you have a lot of new content to write, right? Uh, you have zero blog posts, even if you create the top 50, you're going to break them down into three or four or five topics, you're going to work on this type of content and so forth. But at some point, as you keep working, as you keep going, uh, and years passing by, or maybe you are acquiring another blog that you're merging into your own website or doing something else, uh, at some point you reach to 200 pieces, 300, 500, 1000 pieces or more, you know, with news websites, some news websites we have, uh, we work with, uh, they do have over 100,000 pieces or 250,000 pieces. Uh, it's really important to segment them and to categorize them in a way that makes sense, which is why content peers are so important. The concept of content peers, uh, there are two or three different ways to structure them, but in a nutshell, the concept of content peers is picking a topic and then creating multiple pieces around this topic. Again, you can imagine that as a um, you know, category in a news website, but unlike news websites, stories have to be structured in a sense uh, that's complementary to each other. For example, you may have one long form, long piece, top, uh, you know, content pure post that is, you know, in introduction to, to development, for example. And the introduction to development is going to just list down the top 25 steps of what are the most essential steps to start in development. For example, learn the foundations of computer science, then several sentences for this. Then find the right, I don't know, boot camps or the find university to study at. And number three, pick a collection of books and courses and blah, 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 that get the job done. Having the fullest with a few sentences just to have the bigger picture but then creating a complementary list of articles or videos or other materials that fill in the blanks for each of those topics so when google sees something like this you know they see a humongous guide and then they see a bunch of different pieces of content uh, around each of those specific topics and they say okay those these topic pieces are connected because each of the sub stories has a link to the bigger pic uh, to the bigger story the big story itself the big guide the, the intro you know content pure piece has linked to the other stories and so forth so this is kind of more or less how it works you can structure it in different ways you can structure it uh, with cornerstone pages um, and that just happen to be kind of the category page structured in a way with like topics and best practices uh, you can just have like 10 stories linking to one another without having the big uh, uh, pure piece different ways to to organize that depending on the type of blog but this is something that really makes a difference so organizing content just to tell google and to tell your readers that these pieces are related that you care about this topic that's why you have written a bunch of pieces about on this topic is something that's very important number four is consider the entire funnel now we worked with uh, multiple customers uh, this year in particular that haven't really considered the entire content funnel so what does, uh, do I have in mind? Like on one end, we do have the top of the funnel businesses that work with content uh, marketing slash SEO agencies, uh, not really that experienced ones, uh, that say we're going to grow the traffic of this blog, meaning that they produce very generic top of the funnel content that has zero sense whatsoever when it comes to the context of the business, uh, has zero value towards the target audience, but um, again, at the same time, it generates traffic. You know, when you write, let's say you are a political consultancy, well, not political consultancy is too niche. You are a publishing business for printing, printing books, right? And you just write a blog post of uh, 75 uh, or top 100 ways Trump has uh, dominated over the past four years. This is a viral piece. It's going to get a lot of traction. It's very generic, like almost everyone is interested in this in general. Like it doesn't exclude certain audiences, certain industries, people having different industries. It's very, very generic, very broad, very viral. But at the same time, it has nothing, nothing to do with the actual business itself. So those top stories are like, you know, just top uh, 30 headlines um, for Instagram marketers or something else generic, just something that's viral, something that's trendy, something that generates content, top of the funnel. At the same time, you know, it doesn't really convert. It has no value. That's on one end of the of the story. On the on the other hand, uh, we do have the businesses that really don't care that much about content marketing, and they only do the bottom of the funnel. Like they try to say uh, stories that directly convert customers. Normally, a sales purchase, unless you're a B two C business, an um, e commerce or um, SaaS subscription business, unless you're one of these things, the sales process is longer. It takes 
a few more steps uh, and it takes a while to actually process and to actually make successful. And as a result, you can just blast people with a landing page that says, hey, I'm here, uh, you know, buy my expensive services or buy my expensive air conditioners or, or anything like that, which is why having only bottom of the funnel articles is not the key. You have to think of the entire funnel. Where are your top customers supposed to be coming from? What would they need? How to get them closer to the, to the right uh, process of the buying journey? Uh, how to educate them, how to nurture them, how to warm them up, how to build trust with them until we can blast them to the bottom of the funnel. So just really caring about the funnel is super, uh, super, super important. Um, so, so yeah, number five is create evergreen content with a 2020 twist. Here's what I've got in mind. Um, evergreen content is important. Uh, building a database of content that really grows and creating more organic content and just uh, creating link-worthy content, all of that is reliant on some evergreen content. The more, the better. I'm trying to build like 90% evergreen content. You know, news websites, sometimes they build like 3% evergreen content. It really depends on the niche, but the more, the better. Uh, what I'm saying with the 2020 twist is, you know, some best practices are no longer applicable now in times of COVID and in times of crisis uh, or they have adjusted in some way or maybe your perfect target audience no longer ha faces these specific problems and maybe faces different problems in a different way. So uh, in a nutshell, what you need to do is create new evergreen content or update your evergreen content with the 2020 twist, understanding the semantics of the economic recession, understanding the semantics of lockdown, of how some businesses shift and how they evolve. It's still going to be evergreen content, but it's going to be more timely now. It's going to face less competition. It's going to grow faster and sooner and maybe even get viral through different channels. So make sure you still focus on evergreen content, but instead of planning for the next three years of content titles or so, try to be cognizant and, and really recognize the needs of your customers and how their ecosystem is adapting and shifting and evolving right now. Number six is repurpose and compile content. Again, repurposing content is one of my most favorite things in the world. Um, what I really love doing is just recording a bunch of videos, sharing with my team, um, you know, getting transcripts exported and working toward blog posts, then extracting some of those snippets, um, you know, posting them on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on, on Facebook, um, you know, preparing some quotes, uh, here and there for featured images, like all of that just coming off uh, from a video or a conference talk or something else. So repurposing is super important as well. Uh, but once your business keeps growing, you need to understand that repurposing content is not a one-off effort. It's not something that you do once for a bunch of different medias. You actually need to also recycle this content and renovate this content and reuse this content. Now, what am I talking about? Uh, especially as your business is growing and as your content database is growing, you need to also resurface some of these old pieces and reuse them as well. Like you may create compilations out of the small peaks of top videos of 2020 or like uh, top stories over the past five years or like the top red stories um, over the again, past three years or something like that. Sometimes you have old content that you've already repurposed, already reposted, that doesn't mean that you can also reuse it one more time in a year after or like put them in other compilations, in other best practice lists or, or so forth. For example, I do have uh, some marketing videos and I've kind of bundled them into a marketing category. But over time, it turns out that this marketing category also includes a bunch of videos that are under recruitment, how to hire marketing teams, how to you know hire um, assistants, whether you should hire an agency or build you know assistants and then coach them and then grow them and a bunch of those and at the same time i've also recorded different videos on recruitment and i also have different videos on recruiting it talent so as your content database grows um, you can actually repurpose and reuse and create different compilations of your existing content uh, for different audiences and to enrich your library for different audiences that you're targeting or for different problems that your target audience is facing. So recognizing that and just really not abandoning your old top content is really important so that again, you can bundle it in different ways for, for your readers. Really your content is your top asset, one of your top assets. Think creatively of the best way of, of reusing it. Number seven is content formats evolve all the time. 
Now, I've always been a fan of blogging and writing is really my passion. It's the thing that I love the most, but I also recognize that things have changed immensely over the past 15 years. Now, internet was crappy back in the day. Um, I still remember, you know, buying up, dial up cards to connect with a 33.6 or uh, 56 uh, kbytes model, modem to connect to the internet and, you know, having the neighbors being unable to conduct a phone call because the line was already taken, because we had like two different households using the same uh, phone line. It was pretty insane, pretty hard. We had to be really creative and it was impossible to actually download media over the internet. Now, it, um, it was taking me like 25 minutes to just download a song. These days are over, fortunately, uh, in most countries at least. And now it's uh, a lot easier with 4G and with 5G in certain countries. It's a lot easier to actually start to uh, produce content and produce video content and stream this content online, right? It's a lot easier nowadays and lots of people are taking advantage of all that, which is great. Uh, which means that lots, a lot more people are actually watching videos because it's faster, they can see the body language, they can do this and they can do that. At the same time, we have sm smart devices like Google Home, like Alexa, like Siri or Bixby for Samsung that are letting us search online and get access to other resources. We also have podcasts and radio shows and we also have different formats right now. So we need to recognize that as best as possible through repurposing content. We can create content for different audiences so that we can satisfy everyone's needs regardless of what they need. Otherwise, at least we need to target our audience better or we need to create different types of content in order to match the audience. Again, like YouTube wasn't really my network, it never has been, even though, again, I upload there. Start uh, when LinkedIn introduced kind of uh, video support back in late 2017, I started to produce more and more and more video. But at some point, a couple years later, uh, the organic reach was really tough and really impossible to match, which is why I start publishing videos on LinkedIn, or at least they do that very, very rarely. Um, at the same time, slides were the format that works really well. They submitted series, which is kind of newsletters, which is a beta format. It's still not accessible for everyone, which is too important. So I kind of focused on those. However, again, a year ago or so, they also enabled uh, LinkedIn Live and live recordings gather a lot more people. So that's still something that works. So again, producing videos still works, but only if it's live. But at the same time, they also enabled stories. And with LinkedIn stories in the game, again, video is also getting some traction as a result. So understanding that uh, content formats matter is important. You need to be creative. You need to stay ahead of the game and you need to experiment and use them more. Another reason it's so important is um, sometimes, you know, some networks may be successful one way or another, and then they may hit a different blocker that really uh, prevents you from keeping in touch with your audience. Uh, TikTok is a great example. It exploded in no time and then some countries posed a ban on TikTok and now it's really hard to figure out whether it's going to be the most radical platform in the world uh, or it's going to, uh, to really close in the next year or two, at least in, in most countries out there. Uh, which leads me to uh, point number eight, which is own your stack. Now, on owning your content stack is another critical aspect of being a successful content marketer. Um, I've been blogging for the past 15 years across three or four different blogs, uh, but at least for the past two, I merged them into my current blog, which is mariopesho.com. And stories that I've posted externally, I do have a press page, which contains my guest posts. I do repost those, um, you know, stories on a weekly basis with my weekly newsletter with over a thousand subscribers. And, uh, you know, I'm taking care of keeping track of my content, of aggregating my content, of making sure it's still accessible. It's still something that we can reuse. I've also recycled some of this content in different ways, including uh, releasing an actual book, the 126 steps to becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, which is still generated through my own content and sometimes I'm reusing some of those snippets. What I'm saying is I own my stack uh, in the sense of my content is uh, under my kind of copyright, my blog, I own the database, I have backups, I have uh, my email list of the people that I like. Of course, I use social networks, I do give um, you know quotes for different roundup posts, I do guest posts for other websites, but in the grand, grand scheme of things, what I care about is owning my content because networks and um, you know social channels and so forth they come and go 
but really your content is what you have been producing for over a decade and that's what really matters so definitely own your stack um, because um, it's it's super important be it videos or so forth again like if uh, uh, if YouTube sunsets and you have thousands of videos there you definitely want to have a way to download them uh, or have them on an external hard drive or something else even if it's not the top quality in the world just having access to them probably not going to happen with youtube in particular but you know some other network like some more niche network like tiktok you know just getting banned and you having no access to your videos is going to be very devastating so yeah number nine is email is still king you know email has been dying for as long as i remember or at least people say so that's how slack became successful was the you know system that combats email and like so forth but again email is still the if not the first one among the top three most converting channels because everyone has email, it's ubiquitous, uh, you have it on your phone, it doesn't take a lot of traffic, it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth, it's an, it's an open standard, everyone's been using it since for centuries, it's like your own per personal identity, it's not like your ICQ number owned by a specific corporation, it's like a um, specific standard that you have your own unique uh, email or at least a bunch of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, email is still king, so when it comes to, to uh, attention, when it's still to when it comes to keeping track and keeping uh, in touch with your followers and with your uh, subscribers email is still the thing that i find the most valuable out there uh, i've been very very late to the email game i've tried it a couple of times really didn't pay that much attention didn't really didn't put that much effort so i just started out again maybe uh, a little over a year ago which is how i gained uh, the last thousand uh, subscribers 1100 or so uh, and again i mean in no time i saw once again how important it is it's uh, more important than social for me. It's more important than everything else. Doesn't mean that using social is irrelevant, especially if you have a viral channel, if you have a kind of reposting channel or so forth, you just need traction and people, very important. But if you're building a brand, if you're building a brand, you wanna stress on that. Uh, you don't wanna have, uh, again, I still remember Twitter. Lots of my friends left Twitter. I was very active on Twitter seven or eight years ago, had a, big following lots of different people and like i barely see new people joining twitter now right so what do, you, do i do with those 16 or 17 uh, thousand subscribers uh well it's still keep in touch with some of them but um, you know two-thirds of them are no longer using the platform and they don't really actively use the platform and uh unless they follow me on another network that they jump through or some of them don't really use a network either uh it's still something that's going to be really hard to connect with those people in the grand scheme of things so um yeah make sure that everyone has email uh it's not a channel that's going to die anytime soon uh make sure that you own people's emails in the sense of having access to them if they give you the permission and to uh appreciate and respect them quite a lot number 10 is deliver some 10x content uh when i say 10x you may be thinking of grant cardone and you know just having 10x everything which is completely correct of course uh but what i'm saying is you you know some people only deliver 10x content one example is brandine uh with his ultimate guides uh the skype scraper technique just creating a type of content that's always always ahead of game uh always on top of everything you know type of wow incredible insanely wonderful content uh totally that's totally fine totally admirable uh, some people can't afford that especially if you have to produce content at, at scale and you need to you know retain your brand and all that uh, but at least deliver some 10x content you can't just deliver mediocre content you can't just deliver the latest news you also need some top pieces that people recognize that people remember that you can send people to those resources top guides white papers ebooks whatever it is some of them are important for SEO, some of them are important for email uh, list gathering, some of them are important for sales, some of them are important for just brand awareness, but like focusing on 10x content, like real, wow, uh, great content that you're proud of, that you can share with your audience, it's really important. Uh, so um, again, prioritize that, try to spend some time on it, try to think of, you know, the top pieces that most of your readers care about, even if it's you know like one 10x content every three months or so it's still four top pieces a year which is really adding up over time so definitely prioritize that making it work so um here we go these are my top 10 pieces for 2021 i don't believe any of them are going to change uh some of them were kind of covered in, in previous predictions like you know spend more time on voice search or audio search or so uh, again some of those things are kind of reshuffling but again 
if you have to focus on 10 things and you ask me what are the top 10 things I care about in 2021 when it comes to content, uh, that's that's really it. So um, make sure you follow through and I'm also working on another piece of how to stay around as an authority. Uh, make sure you check it out when it's live and um, make sure that you be consistent with your content efforts to ensure that you stay an authority as well. Thank you.